Welcome to this week's episodes of Insights. Uh, this week's show is going to be somewhat unusual. We're sort of trying some new experiments in, in the look of the show and the topic that we're discussing. discussing. This week's uh, topic is going to be the issue of culture, uh, specifically the importance of culture as a weapon and how it can be used to tell one story and more importantly, how to impose your will on the world using that story. And why is culture important? Because in the modern context, uh, politics is in many ways downstream from the culture. If you win the culture war, you will eventually win the political war. Now, what is culture? What do we mean by culture in the modern sense? Uh, Culture in the modern sense is really very much public relations oriented. Uh, It is a story that a culture tells about itself to the world, uh, essentially what your story is. So before we get to what our story should be or could be, we need to look back at what our story as Armenians or as Armenia has been for the past 30 to 100 years. If we really understand what story we have told the world for the past many years, it essentially comes down to three things. The first thing is that we were the victims of the first genocide of the 20th century, which is unfortunately the thing that people most know about us. Uh, And frankly, what we have to understand is that as much as we tell the story, nobody cares. And part of the reason that nobody cares is because we've been essentially telling the wrong side of the story. Because what's relevant in the story is not the crucifixion, but the resurrection. And that's the story that we should have been telling all these years. And that should be our narrative today. Moving on, the second part of our story has been the collective struggle for liberation for the people of Artsakh. And uh, what we managed to do is to take a national liberation struggle and a struggle not to be ethnically cleansed or suffer a second genocide. And over time, we essentially let that entire narrative slip away into something where our enemies, talking about territorial integrity, actually won the moral argument before the war. So we managed to essentially let that go and lose that narrative. The last story that we've been, that we love to tell about ourselves is the fact that we are the first Christian nation. Now, not only is this irrelevant in the modern sense, it's actually a net negative at a time where almost all of the Western world, specifically Europe, is busy de-Christianizing itself. So not only is this narrative not helpful, it actually makes us look backwards and reactionary. In order to win the culture war, first of all, you have to understand what the cultural marketplace demands and then do whatever you can to match your narrative to that. Now, again, this is not a question of what is right or what is righteous or what should be correct. It is about what the realities are and actually matching your narrative to whatever the dominant culture is, regardless of what you think is important or what you think should be the problem, the the, the thing that people care about the most. you essentially need to connect your story to the dominant themes and the narratives of the day. You might ask why. And the reason is that modern popular culture uh, is the most powerful force in history since the beginning of capitalism. Over the past 50 years, modern popular culture has destroyed every conservative culture, every supreme leader, every political movement, every religion, and every set of traditional conservative mores and values all over the world, specifically in the Western world where it's began and it's essentially making its way around the world. And why is this? The reason for it is quite simple. The attractiveness of this modern popular culture ideology is that it does not require any sacrifice. And all it asks of you is to be willing to be passively entertained, which is in great contradiction to every religion and political movement that has always required sacrifice and self-limitation. Modern popular culture is the exact opposite of that, which explains its attractiveness. Let me give you a perfect example of this. Uh, Let's go to Twitter. This man, the President of the United States, has 32 million Twitter followers. Kim Kardashian has 70 million Twitter followers. Realistically, who really has more influence on what happens in the culture of the world and the way people think and act on a daily basis, the President of the United States, or really well-known celebrities. 
let's move on and understand what are the, the sort of the driving principles of what we call this modern Western popular culture, uh, which is so dominant. It's actually four different things. The first one is that is, it is instinctively anti-totalitarian and pro-democratic. And it has a very distinct freedom narrative. It's this whole notion that there's a, there's a world that is united in its uh, quest for ever and greater freedom, which is, you know, is, is, is understood in its own context of the, of the Western context, and for ever more democratic worlds. So it essentially hates every totalitarian system and totalitarian leader out there. Uh, secondly, it believes that the personal is always political and it, 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 it opposes any limitations on personal freedom, uh, self-expression, and how one describes itself to the world. If you want to understand the sort of the obsession of Western governments on LGBT rights uh, or transgendered rights, it needs to be understood in this concept because for them, this is the front, the front line of freedom in uh, the narrative that you're pushing, which you cannot have constraints on individuals. Uh, let me give you a perfect example of what this means in practical terms. During the war, the Azeri and the Turkish regimes deliberately targeted the main cathedral in Shushi with long range rockets. And they attacked it multiple times while there were civilians hiding inside of it. This received some attention, but imagine the attention that it would have received that instead of targeting the cathedral, they had attacked the Shushi Gay and Lesbian Center. Because if they had done so, if such a place existed, it would have been in the front page of the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the London Times, and Le Mans, and every other Western newspaper. Because there are certain people that matter, and there are certain people who don't. The third principle of modern Western popular culture is what I call broadly anti-racism. Uh, it essentially opposes all kinds of anything that it considers bigotry. However, this opposition to racism actually has two sets of victims. There are the sacred victims that are worthy of defending, who matter, and then there are the unsacred victims who are not worthy of defending. Our job is to align ourselves to become part of the sacred victim that deserve to be defending. Lastly, and this is key, the fourth principle is this almost messianic belief that the entire world, all of the world, demands the same set of values. Western liberal values are the dominant values that everyone demands from the villages of Afghanistan to the slums of Peru to the posh neighborhoods of Paris or London or New York. The perfect example of this is a uh, program that the United States government had that spent $700 million teaching rural Afghan women about modern conceptual art. So this is in some ways often called the first piece of conceptual art. Does anyone know what it is? I don't expect the ladies to know. Oh, exactly. An artist called Marcel Duchamp, who's very important in Western art, put this toilet in an art gallery about a hundred years ago. It was a huge revolution. Then people wonder why the Taliban won the war. Coming closer to our part of the world, guess who is the living antithesis to all of these four values? This guy. Now let's move on to practical things. How do we tell our story in a way that matches the dominant themes of Western modern culture? First one, a simple one. We need to constantly say every occasion that we have, especially dealing with Westerners, that Armenia is an island of freedom in a sea of tyranny. This need to be said over and over again for, un, for us to understand which side of the divide we're on. Secondly, we need to talk about the fact that we are a democratic state that is being attacked by neo-fascist ones. This needs to be said over and over again in every occasion. In short, this is us. This is Ilhan's kingdom. Hey, hey, hey.
The second point, we as a people have paid a terrible price uh, because of bigotry and racist hatred and prejudice. Our narrative concerning Artsakh and Armenia should always be put in the context of anti-racism and anti-fascism. It is important for us to universalize our pain by connecting to other people while we are nationalizing our gain. Let's move on to the third point, which is tolerance and diversity. And we need to come up with examples of this and constantly talk about it. And there are many of them to be talked about. Let's take a very recent example. In Armenia, every single day in the streets of Yerevan, you will see Azeris from Iran walking around the streets of Yerevan speaking Azeri while no one does anything to them. In fact, you will see them in line to get vaccinated for free uh, while no one bothers them as they speak in their language, which is what the way it should be. However, we know that if there's two Armenians that ever dare or even allow to enter Baku, and if they speak Armenian, they will be lynched. Second example, in Armenia, a transgendered person actually made a speech in the Armenian parliament from the dais of the parliament. In, er, in, uh, in Aliyev's Azerbaijan, that country is rated as the worst place to be gay in Europe. In truth, this is something that needs to be said over and over again whenever we're describing the Aliyev regime, that it was rated as the worst place to be gay in Europe. It doesn't matter what our feelings are about this matter, but the truth of it is, if you want to get press and you want to get attention, you will get a lot more attention by making this point in trying to frame him for what he is than for a thousand and one articles talking about the destruction of our culture of monuments in Artsakh. It is a sad fact, but it is an empirical truth. And our job is to deal with cold, hard realities. For anyone who doubts the power of popular culture, I will remind you of this guy. Today at the embassy with Nazarbayev inside, Borat rebutted the Kazakh ads. I would like to make a comment on the recent advertisements on television and in media about my nation of Kazakhstan saying that women are treated equally and that all religions are tolerated. These are disgusting fabrications. These are my country of Kazakhstan. There is not enough money in the world to correct the PR damage that this one person with his one movie did to the country of Kazakhstan. In conclusion, what is our job? Our job is to simplify and repeat, simplify and repeat the concept until it becomes the dominant narratives that we are the country that exports TUMO centers to the world, while Aliyev is the one who exports hitmen that kill international journalists and dissidents around the world. Culture and language weaponized is simply warfare in other means. Let's get to work.